Okay. Yeah. I think one of the questions how do you change it? I think it's like problem six. I'll be doing the same thing. Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. Hi, Professor. How are you? Hey, Trevor. I'm okay. Who under the weather? <laughs> uh, is it, is it the cold or? Uh, honestly, I think I I uh, I vacuumed a lot in my house over the weekend. I finally had a good chance to clean. But I think I kicked up a lot of dust in the air, so I have a lot of my uh, just sneezing and a bunch of mucus got in my throat. So now I have kind of a cough because of that too. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, it's just it's just like kind of a runny nose and a cough and a sneeze. So I, I don't think it's cold. It's just uh, 
Yeah, just allergies and stuff acting up. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it doesn't get worse, though. So. Yeah, thanks. What's up? Uh, nothing much. Just saying hi. Oh, okay. Hey, Professor. Yep, what's up? Hey, um, I remember you talking about five centimeters per second. Did yeah. you have a chance to see um the Susume? I actually did. So I, I, I didn't have plans to watch over the weekend, but my wife really wanted to see it. So we went to like a like a 10.30 p.m. showing on Saturday night, um, which, which probably may have led to me getting sick also. Um, but yeah, it was good. I, I liked it. Yeah, uh, we saw it this Saturday, too. It was pretty good. I was. Uh, I think it was better than the last movie he did, which was Weathering with You. Um, but uh, I think Your Name is still probably my favorite out of the movies that he's done. But uh, but Susan is, is is still very. It was really good. Yeah, I, I heard good things about Your Name. Um, I heard that they're all like somewhat connected. I can kind of see. I can kind of see that. I mean, they're they're all. He kind of, he kind of does like, I would say somewhat similar stories and like somewhat similar characters um, in all his movies. So yeah, there's a lot of similarities, but uh, um, I can see that. Like I know in, in Weathering With You, there was a cameo from, uh, from your name in there. Uh, I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but, um, but there might, there might've been like a cameo in, in Susan May that I didn't notice, but um, he like, he likes to, like, I know the director likes to do stuff like that. Yeah, I'll have to check out the other ones now because uh, we we really like Susume. 
So yeah, so yeah, they're all they're all pretty good. Yeah, I would definitely check them out. Um, Dr. Chan, I don't want to interrupt, but can you sure. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sounds good. All right, it's uh, seven o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Doing good, doing good. I'm a little bit under the weather today, so I've been uh, sneezing and coughing a lot today, and so I may have to stop just mid-sentence and cough, and so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully, I feel better by by Wednesday. Right? Um, so this week is a is a break week, and so you know I know we did two weeks of antis activities in a row. Uh, so this week we don't have an antis activity plan. 
Uh, but instead, we're going to talk about um, today. We're going to talk about verification and validation. Um, and I've planned for the whole week to be on this stuff, but I realize I, I may only have one lecture worth of content on BNB. Um, and so maybe on Wednesday we'll go over uh, heat transfer simulations and Francis, um, just because I don't have anything else planned. And so you know, we'll see how far we get today, um, and then uh, you know we'll uh, we'll figure out a plan for for Wednesday. Okay. okay. Uh, so announcements. So activity six is due uh, this Friday, and so you guys have a little extra time for that one, uh, just because of you know it is it is a little bit of a lengthier assignment because the optimization takes a while to run. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know the only thing out there right now is the final project. Okay? Um, remember, for the final project, you can work on whichever geometry that you want, and so you can you can choose your own. Uh, but if you do want to choose your own geometry for the final project, you have to run it by if you run it by me first, okay? just to make sure that there's enough complexity and just to make sure that it's uh, practical enough to do uh, within the confines of the student version of, of ANSYS. <coughs> okay, uh, so I think that's all my announcements. Are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the topic for today's lecture is called verification and validation. Sometimes these two things together because they they normally they they're different and so you know what we're going to talk today about their differences but sometimes they're they're lumped together in one so sometimes they're often called B and okay and so let me start by saying that you know throughout this class. You know, hopefully I've convinced you by the fact that, you know, finite element simulations are really powerful tools for engineering design and analysis. And so if you set up the finite element simulation correctly, you know, with the with the right mesh and the right boundary conditions, you can simulate, you know, very complex physical phenomenon that would normally otherwise be very expensive to test. Okay. Um, and so the idea behind uh, finite elements is that it, it very quickly and very easily lets us to see, you know, what the result of a physical situation is going to be. Okay. But one thing I want you guys to remember is that, you know, finite elements. It's just a model of reality. It's not, act, it's not actually predicting, you know, reality itself, but it's just kind of a representation, just a model of reality. And that model, you know, can be wrong. And so, and, then, and we've we've seen that a lot in this class. And, there, and so, there's a lot of ways that you can set up a finite element simulation, and for it to be just completely wrong. Okay. Because ultimately, you know, what finite elements is, finite elements is just a very fancy way of solving, you know, differential equations, right? And so a lot of times whenever we have a physical phenomenon, you know, we have an underlying mathematical model. Oftentimes it's some kind of partial differential equation. Um, and finite elements basically just gives us a way to solve those equations, okay? And so there's kind of two levels of, of, of wrongness that can occur, right? Um, on the first hand, you know, you might have a situation where, you know, you have your equations, 
um, but you just solve them incorrectly. Okay. And so maybe you know what the equations are, but just due to your setup, maybe due to your mesh or maybe due to, you know, um, certain other conditions, you know, you just don't, you don't even get the right answer to the equation that you're trying to solve. Okay. Or the other thing that can happen is that maybe you're not even solving the right equations to begin with, right? Maybe you're, you're in a situation where, um, you know, you need to either solve a more complex equation, or maybe you, you didn't account for certain types of, uh, certain types of phenomena. Okay. So these, so these problems are, are not just unique to finite elements. So anytime you have any kind of mathematical model or any kind of model-based design or model-based analysis, you know, these problems can, can crop up, okay? So the idea with verification and validation is that these kind of give us ways to, you know, not only make sure that we're, we're doing things properly, that we're, you know, solving the equation correctly, we're solving the right equations, but they also kind of give us a way to, you know, increase our faith or increase our confidence in our FDA results that they're actually something significant and actually you know, a good model for reality. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is, is kind of, you know, what is verification and validation? You know, why are they important? And, you know, what do you need to do as a user in order to increase the faith of your, increase the faith of your results? Okay. And so, you know, I, I think I mentioned it, you know, earlier in this class, you know, especially when we talked about the midterm project, you know, your, your biggest challenge when, uh, if you're going to be using finite elements in, in any kind of capacity in your career, your, big, your biggest challenge is not going to be running the simulation itself. And so that, that part, believe it or not, is, is the easiest. It's definitely the most fun. It's the most fun and the easiest part of, of your job. The most difficult part of your job is going to be convincing people that what you actually simulate is actually useful and is actually accurate. Okay? And so verification and validation are just kind of more tools or just more just kind of ways of thinking that you can use um, to increase the faith and increase the, the confidence in your simulation results, okay? There's a very old saying, um, and I should, I should know who said this, but I, I don't know who said it. I always forget his name. But there's an old saying that goes, you know, all models are wrong, okay? So no matter how complex the equation that you're solving, no matter how sophisticated your software is, you know, you're going to get something that's wrong because it's not, it's not mother nature at the end of the day, right? And he didn't, that, that, that quote there is not meant to be contrarian, although a lot of people kind of interpret it as being, you know, this guy's just being, just being an asshole. Um, but the reality is, you know, you can have the most sophisticated finite element simulation in the world. And even something as simple as predicting the, the deformation of like a beam or something, right? You're not going to get it right. You know, you're going to get it right up to a certain point, but you're never going to get it right up to like, you know, the 57th decimal, right? That's just, that's just impossible. Um, and so, and so the full quote goes, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful, okay? And so the idea with verification and validation is, you know, what are some ways, what are some tests that we can run to show people that our finite element results are useful, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's let's start from the basics. And so you know, if you'll notice, kind of early in this, in the middle of this page, you know, I've underlined the the term model. Right. I may have used this term, you know, a couple times uh, throughout the course, but let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Okay. So what is a model? So in uh, in plain words, you know, a model for reality is something that can give you a prediction of what reality will be without actually going out and measuring. So this is a very broad definition because there's there's a lot of different types of models out there, and so if you if you follow finances or anything like that, you've probably heard of you know market models, right? And so those are basically computational models that predict you know how the market is going to be, how the stock market is going to be, and all and all that stuff. So people take modeling very seriously, but for but for our purposes, you know we're we're going to kind of restrict ourselves to mathematical models of physical phenomena, right? So basically the same as what we've been doing in this in this class so far. So let's let me give you an example, right? Because a model could be almost anything, and so you know its its uh, its, its definition is is very 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 broad. Let's do a very simple example. So let's say we're designing a cantilever beam and on this beam we're gonna have a force that kind of hangs off the edge like that. We have a simple beam, we have a fixed support on one end, and on the other side, we have a downward force. Okay. All right. And so, you know, very in very much in line with kind of how we how we usually do in this class, you know, we want to find what the maximum force that we could that we could apply, or in other words, the maximum value of F um, that can be applied before this beam will break. So I could very easily, you know, give this to you as as like an ANSYS activity. So this would be kind of very much in line with, you know, activities two or three, right? Uh, in fact, this is actually this is practically what we did for activity two. Okay? So one way we could solve we could uh, solve this question. One way we can we can answer this is we could throw it into ANSYS. And so I think everyone in the class is kind of familiar with, you know, how we would traditionally solve this with ANSYS. And so, you know, the way we do this is we'd, we'd, we'd first create a CAD model for our beam. Okay? We'd upload, we'd uh, import that into ANSYS. We'd open up ANSYS Mechanical. We would mesh the geometry. You know, if we're feeling fancy, we could do like a mesh convergence test. You know, we will apply the boundary conditions. We have a fixed support on one side, the force on the other. Uh, we run the simulation and we just keep incrementally increasing F until we reach the yield strength, okay? And so we could do this in ANSYS. And so this, this is one example of a model.
So in other words, you know, ANSYS gives us a way to predict, you know, predict the reality for this uh, cantilever beam, you know, without us actually having to construct the beam and increase the forces, right? So that's how you would do it. Okay? Another way you can do this is uh, we can ask my, well, at the time when I wrote these notes, he was nine years old. So now he is, uh, he's 13, um, time flies. So we can ask my 13 year old cousin, you know, what's the maximum value of F that this beam can withstand before breaking? So let's ask 13 year old, his name is Jordan. So I took, I took my notes with me uh, to my family Christmas party because I am a freaking nerd like that, right? And I showed this to, to Jordan. I'm like, Jordan, what do you think the maximum value of the force F that this beam can withstand before breaking? Um, and he told me five. That's literally what he told me. Not even mine. That's, 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 that's what he told me, right? So I asked him, you know, what are the units of F? Five what? And he just said five. <laughs> I'm like, all right, answer is five. Let's go with that. Okay. Believe it or not, as ridiculous as this sounds, as ridiculous as asking your, you know, nine-year-old cousin, you know, how 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 much force this can this can hold. Believe it or not, this is also a model. Because this fits the definition for a model, right? And so it's a prediction of what's going to happen in reality without you actually having to go do it, okay? That's not to say that it's a very good prediction, right? And so, you know, we just have F is equal to five, but technically it is a prediction, right? And so, of course, you know, the ANSYS model is going to give us a much more reliable answer than, you know, than your nine-year-old cousin, right? I guess it depends on how smart your cousins are. But but generally speaking, you know, ANSYS is going to be a better, it's going to give us a better answer. Okay. Of course, you know, this is kind of a ridiculous example. So, you know, of course you would know that, you know, a computer software that's designed for this is going to be better for this. But it would be better if we had kind of, you know, systematic tests, if we had, you know, actual ways to kind of prove and show, you know, which models are better than the others. Another way you can phrase that question is, you know, how is there a systematic way to kind of rate how good one model is, you know, relative to another? Because right? we're, we're kind of at an interesting time in, in, in uh, FEA because it seems like a lot of companies are kind of trying to stick their foot or stick their fingers into kind of the FEA pot. And so, you know, for the long time, you know, the, the two main players in the game were Ansys and Abacus, right? And so those were the two main fine element softwares. But what you're seeing nowadays is that a lot of other companies, uh, companies like SolidWorks, uh, even companies like Katia uh, or softwares like Katia, they're trying to develop their own finite element softwares. And so, you know, a, a relative, a, a very good question to ask is, you know, how good are those finite element models? And is there a way to kind of see which one's better than the other? So that's, that's, what, that's what verification and validation is all about. <laughs> All right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay.
All right, so let's uh, so let's define what verification and validation are. So let's start with verification. So the, the strict definition for verification is to assess the numerical accuracy of a numerical simulation uh, relative to the true solution of the mathematical equations. That's a very stuffy definition and one that I don't remember. And so the way I think about ver verification is I, I like to ask a very simple question. Okay. So another way to, to, uh, to summarize verification is to ask, you know, are we solving the equations correctly? So given a situation you know, where we have the, the equations that we want to solve, and so let's say that we want to solve the static structural equations, you know, is the answer that we're getting an actual good solution to those equations? Okay. So let me bring up kind of a, uh, you know, something that we've been going over this class. Um, mesh conversions tests, believe it or not, are, an, are a form of verification. <laughs> um, Dr. Chan. Yes. Is the mesh convergence test the most popular form of verification? Uh, it's something that you do have to do. Um, it's not really a popular thing or not, because it's something that you, you kind of have to do. As a user, it's the it's the it's the most common one that people have to do. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. I mean, because uh, because you know, as a user, you normally don't do the other forms of verification. So the other forms of verification involve you know, actually testing your code to make sure that the code gives you an actual good solution. So there's kind of various levels to this. So I see. Um, you so, know. so the mesh conversion test, you would describe it as the most common form of verification and the most simplest form of verification? Uh, it's, it's the one that, that users, that, that strictly users have to do. So most of the verification is actually done by the developers of the code. I see, I see. So if you're developing a new code for, uh, for free elements, you know, you have to verify that, you know, your code actually gives the right solution. And so uh, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about this in a bit, but there's a lot of benchmarks, uh, benchmark tests that you can do um, and kind of, you know, um, sol uh, solved out problems to make sure that you're, you're actually getting the right solution. Uh, but yeah, there's different good, levels of verification that you have to do. Sounds good, sir. Okay, so that's verification. Next was to find validation. So for validation, you know, the uh, what we want to do is we want to assess the accuracy of our mathematical model. Uh, 
relative to observation, um, op observations in nature. The observations in reality. So validation is, is, you can almost think of it as asking a more broader question to say that, you know, is our mathematical model, you know, we have our equations, we have our method for solving the equations, okay? Um, so is that whole package combined? So the equations that we chose and the method that we chose to solve it, is that actually giving us a good prediction for reality, okay? So usually I like to uh, sum this up, just like verification, I like to sum, sum it up as a couple questions. First of all, you should ask yourself, are we even, are we solving the right equations? And so it could be something as simple as like, you know, if, are you using a static structural, you know, simulation to, uh, to model a dynamic situation, right? And so if you have a dynamic situation, you know, you probably simulate it with, you know, explicit dynamics or, um, uh, or, uh, or some other time dependent uh, phenomenon, right? Or time dependent method. Okay. Question is, did we set up the problem correctly? And so what I mean by that is, you know, did we use the right boundary conditions that we, uh, you know, use the right magnitudes for the boundary conditions, right? Is our CAD model correct? Is it uh, you know, accurate? You know, did we make too many assumptions in our, in our geometry? You know, things, all things like that. Okay. Um, Dr. Chan, I have a question. Sure. So uh, I was thinking um, for validation, um, um, if you have two engineers that do FEA completely separate from each other um, and they do FEA for a given condition, for a given loading condition, and they yep. get the same, and, and, and then they both have a meeting to uh, consult with one another on the results. And it turns out that they both get the same results. So the FEA may have some differences, like maybe the elements are different or I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but the results are the same. Would that also be safe? Would, would, that, would that also validate your FEA if another engineer also got the same results, even though you, did, even though you two did not communicate while you guys were doing the FEA uh, setting up the simulation? I would say that's more a form of verification. And so okay. that's that's saying that, you know, both of their FEA setups are the same. I mean, of okay. course, there's there's um, there's there's diff there may be differences in how they set up their boundary conditions. But when you're talking yes. about validation, you're you're strictly you're more kind of strictly talking about, you know, your simulation results versus reality. Um, and so, you know, uh, we'll talk about this uh, soon in a second. But mm -hmm. the most it sounds good. One thing that I may be getting ahead of myself, but one thing that's popping up into my head is testing. Does testing yeah. come into play? Or, but, yeah, that, that's, ex that's exactly what this is. And so a lot of times, you know, when you're first, you know, making a code. Oh, okay. You're going to run what's called a validation experiment. And so you're going to run oh, an experiment in a very uh, physical experiment in a very kind of controlled way. And then try to recreate those results um, in FEA or in simulations. And so, you know, if you could do that and you could show that your FEA gets the same results as your physical test, that's that's kind of the the gold standard, and so that's that's kind of what sets the bar for validation. It sounds good, sir. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. And so you know, again, you know, just like verification, you know, validation is is more 
it's a bigger question for those people who are developing their own FDA codes. And so the people who work at ANSYS, you know, they're they're probably worried about this way more than we are. But at the same time, you know, as users, there there are things that we can do uh, to validate our results. And so I would say the most common mistake that people make, or not mistake, you know, it's not really a mistake. It's just kind of how they set up their their boundary condition. Think about it, you know, the boundary conditions are kind of like the mathematical representation of how, you know, of, of all kind of the physical constraints and physical loads that are on our on our geometry. Okay? And so whenever you have situations where, you know, and, and students come to me all the time for, for these questions, you know, they're, they're getting results that, you know, maybe doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, the first thing, the first thing I always ask them is, you know, let's take a look at your boundary conditions and, and talk to me about kind of the physical situation that you're trying to set up. And a lot of times it's difficult. And a lot of times, you know, even though ANSYS has a lot of tools that are available to you for the boundary conditions, a lot of times there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's not that kind of like a perfect boundary condition to, you know, to match your physical situation. Right? And so just naturally you have to make some assumptions. You have to make some, uh, some choices in terms of how you actually want to set this up. Okay. especially for the very complex situations. And so, you know, as, as you get kind of the more and more complex kind of physical situations, it becomes a lot more difficult to choose what the right boundary condition is. Uh, but that's all the more reason to kind of question that and to kind of make sure that you're, you're trying to make those as accurate as, as possible. Okay. <coughs> okay. And so in truth, you know, it's kind of just kind of like what we've been discussing, you know, verification and validation is something that, you know, most users will not see 99% of them. And so these are mostly questions for developers to answer. Okay. And so if you're developing a final element code, you know, so let's say you work at ANSYS or let's say you're developing your own research code, you know, it's it, the onus is kind of on you to show that the code that you're um, that you're making is properly verified and properly validated. So as a user, you know, especially as a user of a software like Ansys, where you're paying, you know, a very large amount of money to use, you know, you part of the part of what you're paying for is you're paying for the kind of the faith and reliability in the result. Okay. Um, and so a company like Ansys, and actually, you know, quite rare uh, in reality. So there's there's not many companies like Ansys out there, you know. Because uh, it's a lot of work. It's what you'll see is that there's a lot of work that goes into ver verifying and validating your software, you know, and those are kind of like the bare minimums. So you have to put in all this work just so people could actually use your software reliably. Right? Um, and it's not like this is kind of like you know, this is this is very highly specialized work that you have to pay people for as well. So you know, you have to pay a lot of money for this. Um, so that's kind of what you pay for. But at the same time, as users, there are still things that you have to do to kind of show that your results are you know, properly verified, excuse me, and properly uh, validated. And so that's that's what we'll mostly focus on today. We'll talk a little bit about you know what what as developers you have to do in order to do to uh, to show these things, but we'll mostly talk from a from a user. Okay, okay I'm gonna grab a tissue and then I'll. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, 
And so what do you have to worry about as a user regarding verification and validation? So there's two there's two main things that uh, that people look out for, you know. And so even if you're using like a, a well respected software like Ansys, you know, people are going to be looking out for these kind of things in your, in your results. Okay. And so the first thing is poor mesh quality. And so we've talked about this, you know, at length in this class. And so, you know, if you have poor mesh quality, right? Doesn't matter if you set up everything else correctly, you know, you're not going to solve the equations correctly if your mesh is, is poor, right? And you are have to be concerned with is poor, what I call poor modeling decisions. So that encompasses a lot of the a lot of the other parts of the you know, what I consider to be the finite element methodology is making sure you choose the right material, making sure you choose the right material model, <laughs> making sure you choose the right equations. And so, you know, the, uh, the static structural is, is uh, you know, those, those things are uh, specified well, your boundary conditions are specified well. Um, and if you need to include things like nonlinearities, you know, all of it kind of falls into that. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, having knowledge of, of V and V, you know, even though you're not going to be doing most of it, um, it's still really useful for you to kind of show, um, you know, that your results are, are accurate and reliable. Okay. okay, so let's talk. Let's talk a little bit more about mesh convergence. And so just like I mentioned, you know, mesh convergence tests kind of fall under the category of verification, okay? And so the idea with mesh convergence tests is to, you know, again, make sure that, you know, you, you have a sufficient number of elements or that the order for your, uh, for your simulation is sufficient enough to get as accurate of a result as possible. Because one thing as a user that's going to prevent you from solving the equations correctly is a poor quality mesh. Okay. And so it's important to note that, you know, when you do have errors associated with your mesh, or when you have results that are you know, inaccurate because of your mesh, these errors are purely numerical, okay? Um, and so, you know, from a modeling perspective, in terms of, you know, choosing the right equations, choosing the right boundary conditions, you kind of did everything you could. But if you have a poor quality mesh, you know, you're just not going to get the right solution to that equation.
And so, you know, we've, we've all kind of seen mesh convergence tests at this point, but let me go ahead and draw a, a sketch, just kind of show you. Oftentimes, you know, they're, they're set up in different ways. Uh, and so some people like on the horizontal axis, they like to put the element size. Uh, typically with the way I like to do this, I like to, I like to put the number of elements on the horizontal axis. Uh, but you could you could very easily have one of these convergence tests with the element size as, as well, right? It's just kind of a personal preference thing. But if you if you if you have a mesh convergence test with the element size, uh, you know what that's going to do is that it's going to it's going to converge to the left versus the right. Usually, I like to see things converge to the right. Okay. And so, on the vertical axis, we have some quantity of interest. And usually what you'll do is you're gonna run the simulation at various mesh densities. And so you're gonna increase or refine the mesh. Is that eventually, you know, your results are gonna flatten it out. Okay. But this point right here, numerical errors are minimized. Those are kind of the best meshes that you can run. All right. So as a user, you know the mesh convergence test is kind of the the big the big thing that you should do in order to uh, to verify your results. Okay. In reality, you know, when, when people talk about verification, you know, what they're talking, what they usually are referring to is, you know, making sure that their finite element method is, is implemented correctly. And so, uh, and so for the people that work at ANSYS, this means that they're running their code. Uh, they're running their code against a lot of kind of, um, you know, benchmark problems uh, to basically make sure that, you know, the way that they set up their code, the way that they implemented it, you could get the results of these kind of benchmark problems, uh, you know, just right. Okay. Okay, but if you're using like a software like Ansys, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff because you know that's what you're paying for. You're paying for the Ansys people to do you know a lot of this work for you. Okay, but I do want to make a word of caution. So you know, because I know some of you are, are going to be um, some of you are working on research and things like that. So you're you're going to be using software that are not Ansys. Right? And so when you're using these kinds of the other softwares, a lot of times these other softwares are free, okay? Uh, just be warned that these, that these softwares are not as well va verified and not as well validated either as like a commercial software like Ansys. Dr. Chine. Yeah. Are you familiar with open phone? Yes, I am. Um, does that does this statement apply to to that software? Uh so open phone is, is a unique case. So it is open source, uh, but it's a very it's a very well tested open source uh project. And so it's 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 something that the community actually all kind of got behind and it has a lot of developers and a lot of people contributing to it. And so I would say open foam is, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, it's actually better than ANSYS because it, it doesn't have a, a, a limitation on the number of elements uh, or the amount of cells that you can that you can have. Uh, but but open foam has been tested and and verified and validated across a lot of different applications. And so you know, open foam is kind of unique because of, because of how famous it is and because of how I would say tight knit the uh, the community behind it is. 
Um, but and so if it's if you're working with kind of a well-known software like that, it's it's you know you you have less to worry about. Um, but usually, you know, if you're if you're working in research, you know, a lot of times you're working on applications that are uh, pretty niche or pretty unique. And so, you know, it, it definitely never hurts to do some kind of validation or some kind of verification, um, you know, just for yourself to kind of prove to yourself that you know the software that you're using is 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 good. Uh, and a lot of times, if you do these kind of benchmark tests, you learn a lot about the software itself too, so that you can kind of learn, you know, what are kind of the best ways to set up problems uh, in the software. Sounds good. A question in the chat. So what should we do if a couple of the points are not in the range? Um, and so if they don't follow these uh, these trends right here. Uh, so the way the way I've been having you guys do kind of mesh convergence tests. And so, you know, for a lot of for a lot of the tests, you know, we just look at kind of the maximum value of the stress or the maximum value of the deformation. Uh, that's 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 actually not the most reliable way to do this, because what can happen sometimes? Um, you know, let's 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 take an example. Let's so let's say you have a, a geometry with kind of a sharp corner uh, or a sharp edge in your uh, in your simulation. Okay, what's going to happen at that sharp corner, kind of like we talked about before, is that you're going to have a stress that kind of concentrates at that corner, uh, no matter how much you refine the mesh. Okay, um, and so you know, some cases may not be as obvious as that, but you may have some cases where you know you have uh, um, kind of like outlier results. And so you know, if it's only occurring at a couple of data points, um, you know, maybe you can kind of ignore it. But a kind of a more stable way to uh, to do these tests is instead of taking the maximum, um, maybe take like an average stress. Maybe take like an average stress or an average deformation in a certain area. Uh, that that that'll be a more stable, more reliable way to do these tests. Yeah, probably make note of that. That's a good question. Uh, Because when you're looking at the maximums, you know sometimes the maximums can be, um, you know, they can behave a little bit strange depending on your on your geometry. Okay? I'll give you another example. So I have a student that's working on uh, kind of CFD simulations uh, right now in, in Kansas. And so we were discussing it just this morning, actually. And so he was getting some strange results where, like, you know, he was getting very high values of stress or very high values of shear stress right near the entrance of the uh, of the domain. And so. That's not something that, you know, and so we talked about today that, you know, those are just purely just kind of edge effects. Those are not kind of representative of the entire simulation, which is sometimes, sometimes near the edges of your domain or sometimes in kind of weird areas of your geometry, you, know, you may get some kind of weird or kind of outlandish results. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of up to you as, as a user to kind of identify those um, and kind of, uh, you know, either um, average around them. Uh, or maybe you know selectively kind of ignore them or selectively kind of remove them from your simulation results. And so you know, it's something you kind of get good with, uh, with the practice. Okay. The, uh, so that's so that's kind of the extent of verification. So you know, of course, there's there's a lot more to talk about. You know, if if this were a course on kind of developing your own FEA software, uh, but that's kind of where I want to leave it in terms of uh, in terms of that. Because this class is more about usage more than more than development. Right? Um, all right. So, any other questions on verification before we move on? Okay. So let's talk about validation now. <coughs> okay. So for validation, you know, there's there's actually a lot that you can actually do. And so there's different levels of validation that you can that you can perform, uh, but some of which is not really practical for just kind of an everyday user of FEA, but they're useful to kind of know just in general, uh, in case you were, you know, uh, interested 
uh, or more uh, more specifically, you know, if you're if you're looking to use FEA in a very, I guess, unique kind of situation. And so let's say that you're you're work, you're working on on like on a research application for FEA. You know, most times the, your your research application is something going to be, you know, very niche, very kind of different. So you know, it's 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 always a good idea to do some form of validation and to see kind of which tools there are available to you so that you kind of you know can increase the faith in your results. And so we're going to go through different levels. And so we're going to start with the very best and then go down to the uh, to the worst, I, I guess. Uh, and so let's start with validation experiments. And so remember, when we're talking about validation, you know, we're we're talking about you know making sure that the simulation results that we get are an accurate depiction or an accurate prediction of whatever real life situation we're trying to model. Okay. And so that means, kind of, with that in mind, uh, the best way to validate something is to actually try it out in reality. And so the way that people do this, or, or the way that people kind of do this explicitly, so you know, when they're where they're trying to make a point or they're trying to kind of uh, you know prove that their FEA simulations are accurate, they perform what's called a validation experiment. Okay. Right. So the idea is to kind of create identical situations. So, you know, you have a physical situation, you set it up in a way that you have kind of direct control over as many of the variables as possible. And so you have direct control over the uh, over the geometry. It's machined in kind of a very precise way. Uh, you have direct control over the boundary conditions. And so the, uh, the constraints and the loading. OK, just so that you can kind of uh, recreate it as uh, as perfectly as you can in FDA. OK. Right. And the idea is to try to get the same results in both the experiment and FEA. Okay. okay. And so let's go back to the example that we started with today. So let's go back to the uh, cantilever beam. Let's talk kind of very briefly how you would set this up as a validation experiment. And so here we have two situations or two beams. And so they have the exact same dimensions, the exact same geometry. Okay. On one side, we're going to kind of uh, you know, measure this in the lab. So this is in, in the real world. And so in the lab, what we're going to do is we're going to apply a force. We're going to set it up in a way where we know exactly the magnitude of the force that we're applying, and we're making sure that we apply it in perfectly the vertical direction. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to observe the results in a few different places. And so, you know, normally, you know, unless you have a very sophisticated experimental setup with lasers and optical and then everything like that. Uh, you know, normally it can be very hard to get kind of results kind of everywhere. 
And so it, it's it's hard to get kind of a, a a spatial distribution of the results like you do in FDA. And so what you normally do is that you you kind of just observe the results in kind of key areas, in specific areas. Right? So maybe you're you're measuring the deflection here, or you're measuring the deformation here. Maybe you set up a, a strain meter or a stress meter somewhere else in the in the geometry. You can measure strain at that at that location. Okay. okay. On the other side, we have the kind of the the parallel situation in ANSYS. So of course, in ANSYS, you're going to mesh. You're going to mesh your geometry. What you're going to do is you're going to apply the same loading, okay? same thick supports as well, okay? and you're going to look at your computer results in the same location that you have the measured results. Okay, you're going to compute compute deformation here. Okay, and then your compute the strain here. And the idea is that these two these two should should match. All right, so it sounds fancy, but that's that's basically that's basically what validation is. So, you know, seeing a test like this, you know, it gives people kind of the faith that you know, if, if you know, it may it may not be the exact same cantilever beam, you know, but if you were able to prove, you know, with this cantilever beam here, that you're able to get the same value deformation, the same value for strain, then you know, this kind of gives you confidence that if you use ANSYS on any other cantilever beam, um, that you're going to get results that are accurate and reliable. So the good thing is that if you're using ANSYS and you're using it for, I would say, a fairly common physical situation, and so nothing too exotic, then ANSYS has already, ANSYS the company has already run a bunch of tests like this uh, to show that it's accurate in those situations. So something like a cantilever beam is very well validated. You know, uh, everything we've done so far in the class, I'd say those are all fairly common situations. And so, you know, those are, those are all been tested and validated by ANSYS. And so that's, that's pretty nice. But, you know, if you're using FBA, if you're using ANSYS for a more unique, a more kind of uh, uh, uncommon or niche situation, you know, it's usually not a bad idea to do some validation yourself. Okay. 
And so if you, if you have a ton of resources, of course, you know, a validation experiment would be kind of the best thing that you can do, right? Uh, you know, but realistically, a validation experiment is not, it's not a practical option for most people. Because if you're, if you're going to be, if you're thinking about doing FEA uh, to simulate your situation, then you probably don't have the resources to measure or, or run an experiment for you in the first place. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, if, if and, and this mostly applies for research applications. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly talking to, you know, people who are using FEA for research. You know, if you're, if you're going to be using like a research application, um, you know, you're going to be working with a niche situation. And so the question is always going to come up, you know, are your results accurate or can FEA even be applied for the situation? Okay. And so you're going to have to result to some other methods for validation that um, that's outside of, a, of, a, of an experiment. Um, but, you know, if you do have the resources available, then running a validation experiment is kind of the best, the best thing that you can do. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. So let's talk about kind of the next best thing for validation. If, if you can't run your own experiment, then the next best thing that you can do is try to recreate other people's <clears throat> and so with this, you know, it, it's kind of just exactly as the title kind of uh, states it as. So, you know, if you're if you're not able to run your own experiment, which is you know 99.9 percent .9 of people uh, who are using FEA, right? The reason kind of people use FEA is they're too poor to run an experiment themselves. Um, you know, usually you're gonna you're gonna validate against other published experiments. Or other published observations or other published data, I can say. Okay. I'll give you an example that uh, that I kind of did, or um, you know that I that I kind of took part in a little bit, you know, when I was in grad school. And so, a lot of my a lot of my uh, grad school uh, research had to do with finite element simulations of blood flow. Okay? Uh, and so, one thing that we would validate against, or one thing that you know, one thing that people well, first of all, one thing that people always ask us is that is is this actually legit? Like, can you actually simulate blood flow with FEA? And so we always, it always came into question about, you know, the reliability of our results. Okay. So to kind of validate our results, to kind of show people that our results are good, we validated against uh, clinical measurements. And so a lot of my research, you know, had to do with, you know, um, you take kind of a medical scan of someone's body, you recreate their, a CAD model of their, of their blood vessels, and you run a simulation within those blood vessels to predict, you know, blood pressures and flows and all that stuff. Okay. Um, and so what we would do <coughs> is there's a technique uh, in the clinic that is called PCMRI. And so that stands for phase contrast MRI. MRI stands, for, MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. Yeah. 
PCMRI. And what PCMRI can do is that it can actually measure um, the blood velocities inside a person's body in real time. Right, and so this is this is not very common. And so you know you don't walk into your doctor and you get a PCMRI. And but so these are usually taken for patients that have uh, you know some kind of cardiovascular disease. Okay, and so what we would do is that we would be blinded from this data. So we we did we wouldn't know exactly what they're measuring in PCMRI, uh, but we we would have kind of a scan of their geometry. So we would have like a CT scan, which tell which shows us kind of the geometry of the of the blood vessels, but it doesn't have any velocity information it doesn't have any basically anything you can validate okay so what we do is we would simulate the blood flow the FEA the the geometrical data And what we would try to prove is that we would try to see if our simulation results match the PCMRI data. It's harder than you think, um, and it already sounds pretty hard. It's so, uh, you know, it's definitely it's definitely something that's uh, that's challenging. You know, but this, but but cases like this, you know, this this is actually a very good like research topic. So you know, for something like blood flow, where you know FEA has not been as well explored in that area, and so I would count that as kind of a niche, kind of uncommon situation. Um, you know, if you could perform a validation tests. And so if you find some published data on a, on a certain part and you and you and you're able to recreate that data using simulations, you know, that's pretty important. That's a that's a pretty big find. So you know something like this is actually you know a good research type of project. Um, and I would say it's not done enough because people people often see validation as kind of like the you know, word people use that is it's not sexy. And so it's not you're not coming up with something new, you're not curing cancer or anything like that. You're basically just checking your work. But checking your work is really important because I think, you know, what people sometimes get caught up in is that, you know, they try to come up with the new next big sexy thing in research, but they don't, but no one actually checks their work. So, you know, there's a lot of not bad research, but I would say kind of uh, a lot of research out there that hasn't properly been vetted, um, you know, that that people are using for other stuff too. So it's kind of a, kind of a, bigger, a bigger problem that, uh, you know, is kind of beyond validation and verification. All right, any questions on, on this? All right, I'll give you one more example. So that was kind of a more deliberate kind of uh, thing. Uh, you know, it's not quite the same as a validation experiment, but it's, it's very similar. And so we're collecting data and we're trying to recreate that in, in simulating this. Okay? What if you don't have that? So what if you don't have kind of a, uh, uh, you know, something where you could, you could measure stuff? Uh, another project. I wasn't. I wasn't directly involved in this project, but you know, we were interested in flows uh, in the heart itself, right? So not really the blood vessels, but the heart. Okay? Uh, and so that is normally very difficult to image. But people have published data on it. So like people in, I think it's like in the in the Netherlands or something like that, they were able to get very nice kind of ultrasound <laughs> ultrasound images of the heart, uh, and publish that data.
So this is not kind of new data. So this is not anything new. And in fact, it's published and you kind of knew about it beforehand, right? But the idea is still the same. And so you have kind of um, observations or kind of data on reality and you try to recreate that with simulations. Okay. So there's lots of different levels to this. And so, um, and you know, and, and, I, and I always say that validation is, is never a bad research topic. People, people, you know, think it's not cool or it's not sexy, but it's, it's, it's important. And I think there needs to be more important research done more than you know, sexy information. So. Okay. All right. But what if you have none of the above? What, what if you don't have any data? What if you don't have any experimental anything? So are, is there, is there still a way to validate your results? Um, and so luckily the answer is yes. It's not really validation. And some people would consider this maybe, you know, kind of in the realm of verification, uh, but some people would consider it neither. Some people would consider it silly, okay? But another way that you could at least check your results to make sure at, that, you're, that you're kind of on the right track is to validate against a different model. And so if you have a situation where, you know, you can't, you, there's not really any data that's published or you can't really find any reliable data, okay? You know, you're not really sunk. And so you know, at the very least, what you could do is you could, you could run or use a different model, you know, ideally be some, a somewhat of a reliable model uh, to simulate the same situation and hope that you get the same result. And the idea is that you should use a different method that's not FEA. And so it could even be as simple as like running a, a very simple kind of hand calculation. It's as simple as a hand calculation, you know, and, and, the, and the idea is to, you know, usually if you're gonna do something as simplified as that, you know, you're not going to get a result that's that's the same as your FEA. But the idea is just to perform a sanity check. So, you know, hopefully you're in, you're at least in the same ballpark. You're at least in the same order of magnitude um, as your FEA result, just to kind of give you a little bit of confidence. So remember, that's that's the key here is that, you know, everything we talked about today is different ways that you can increase the amount of confidence in your result. And so usually I call these things, I call these things simplified models. And so, you know, if you get, <laughs> uh, if you can have a simplified model that, that encapsulates your results um, and at least gives you a little bit of, of sanity, you know, that's, that's never a bad thing. Okay. All right, any final questions on, on this? Question, so is the SOLIDWORKS simulation as reliable as ANSYS and static analysis? Yeah, that's uh, that is a very loaded question. So it, it depends on who you ask uh, for that. Um, 
So personally, I would, I would, I would say that for me personally, I haven't tried, I haven't tested it out enough to really have a strong opinion of it. Uh, but there are people, mostly people who have been in FEA for a long time uh, and have used have used ANSYS for years. They will shit on uh, SolidWorks simulation to no end, and so they will go out of their way to, sh to shit on SolidWorks simulation. Um, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's funny. I, I, you know, I would think that if SolidWorks is, is, has the faith to publish it, I would think that they have at least some confidence in it to, to simulate some, at least some simple cases. Uh, but I definitely haven't tried it out enough to really know. Uh, but that would be something that you could try out. And so, you know, one thing that you can do is, uh, you know, if you have, if you, if you want to use SolidWorks simulation, um, you could, you could test it out. So you can run a situation in SolidWorks simulation, try out the exact same simulation in ANSYS, and prepare the results. So that that would be kind of the best thing that you could do for a lot of these situations. And so, you know, I'm going to give a political answer. I will say I don't have an opinion, but uh, but it's it's really because I haven't really tried it out. Yeah, it's and definitely not for my my own application. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Any other questions on on this here? Okay, all right, so that's all we got time for today. And so that's it for verification and validation. So I think on Wednesday, what we'll do is we'll go, we'll go over primer for, uh, for heat transfer simulations. Uh, so there's, there's gonna be no activity with it. I'm just gonna kind of show you how to do it. Because I know some people are interested in doing it for the final project. And so I wanna make sure I at least kind of give you the basics for that. Okay. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Dr. Tron. Thank you, Professor. I hope you feel better. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. Have a good evening.